Uh, the first speaker, Rian Davis. No, I want to introduce the faculty because I forgot to do it. To my right, anybody knows this guy? Nobody knows him, right? Um, Bill, Grantham. Aaron Grantham, Bill Lombardi. <laughs> <laughs> so, of course, uh, Ashish uh, to my uh, um, uh, to my left here, Frazad uh, Farzanda uh, to his left, and Rian Davis there, uh, Jay Cotri. Uh, um, who's else here? Uh, Dr. Saw, Jacqueline Saw, and not here. she's not, not here. Not there. And Rianne Davis, actually, who basically uh, filling in for one of our friends who basically threw her under the bus. She put this talk within the last 20 minutes. So everybody, Rianne Davis, she's actually uh, does not need to need any introduction. She's a rising star in our field. Hi, everyone. So I was asked to give a um, talk on PCI complication publications year in review from 2022 to 2023. I apologize if you wrote some papers that I didn't include in this. I kind of went through a PubMed search and um, highlighted a few of the ones that I thought were interesting. Um, where do I point this to? So complications can occur at any point. So in the first paper here, successful aspiration of an avulsed right radial artery. Uh, so this right radial artery appeared that a GR4 guide was advanced up the arm with some difficulty, and upon engagement of the catheter, uh, injection caused embolization of a product into the RCA. Multiple different ways of removing this embolus was attempted without success, with eventual success with a five friend Sophia catheter. And you can see the embolized uh, radial artery there with restoration of flow. Alternatively, life-threatening subclavian artery bleeding following PCI um, with stent implantation. This was a case report. Transradial PCI, very low complications, but some things that we don't think of sometimes is perforation of vessels in our upper arm or shoulder. In this situation, a subclavian artery bleed was occurring. Patients started complaining of some pain and swelling or pain and difficulty in the neck. They thought maybe it was just ischemia. Turns out um, they had a cervical hematoma from a bleeding subclavian artery that was successfully stented um, with a covered stent and sealing of the perforation. Aorta coronary dissections after um, during PCI uh, seen with CTOs. This was insights from the Progress CTO registry published in CCI. Aortic coronary dissections can be potentially um, serious complications. Over 12,000 studies were reviewed, of which incidence was low at 0.2%. Most commonly in the RCA, predominantly seen when we use retrograde techniques. When this did occur, technical and procedural success were lower with similar incidences in hospital MACE. Most were treated with osteostenting. Some were treated with conservative management. No patients, fortunately, required any emergency surgery. Intramural hematomas, this is a rare complication of PCI, and in this case report, um, occurred after um, simple stenting of an LAD intervention with intramural hematoma development. Um, this operator decided to move ahead with just putting overlapping stents in place. Alternatively, in this GRACE report, a cutting balloon was used to treat the lesion after a successful CTO PCI. So there's different ways of treating intramural hematomas. Being aware of that is what's helpful, but using your imaging is also super beneficial. When it comes to putting devices inside the body, any device we put inside the body can get entrapped. Um, this is a great uh, paper that I would state that any early career um, operator should read, Device Entrapment During PCI, published by Sanchez et al. in uh, CCI. Basically goes through over 4,000 different articles, coming up with an algorithmic approach to prevention and management of device entrapment. Sometimes that means pooling, trapping, snaring, plaque modification, telescoping, or surgery. Within the article, it lays out kind of the ins and outs of all these techniques. I think anybody in the room who's ever done a bifurcation intervention has probably had some hiccup along the way. This is a great paper by Rigotti et al. Um, that was published in the Journal of Clinical Medicine. And it highlights many areas within uh, bifurcation PCI that we may run into issues, whether it's initial wiring, it's rewiring, it's uh, device um, entrapment, stent deformation, um, and kind of highlights where these issues can arise and is a great overview. Now, in the event that you do um, lose your stent or get it entrapped, there's different uh, case reports written about how to do this successfully. In this particular uh, paper, 
published by uh, Lorenzani et al. Uh, in the Journal of Invasive Cardiology. An 80-year-old was undergoing RCA-PCI. The stent fell off the balloon um, and then was hanging out fairly far into the aorta. Uh, uh, four millimeter Amplatz gooseneck stair was then used to successfully retrieve it with restoration of flow. Alternatively, in this paper published by Baracus et al., the stent loss um, resulted uh, during uh, PCI and a coronary occlusion occurred. Many techniques were implemented to try to remove um, the stent, including small balloon, um, and attempts at stent uh, snaring were made, but without success. Ultimately, the retrieval um, attempts resulted in a large coronary perforation, and this can occur. It's knowing how to bail yourself out of this is most important. In this situation, a covered stent was deployed, which uh, excluded that lost stent, but also successfully sealed the perforation. In regards to perforation, this paper was published in Open Heart Coronary Perforation Incidents, Outcomes, and Temporal Trends, COPIT, a systemic, uh, systematic review and meta-analysis. Potentially life-threatening coronary perforations can be, so we want to avoid it if possible and learn how to treat it if it does happen. Overall pooled incidence was 0.39%, and it remains similar throughout. One in five coronary perforations led to tamponade. Ellis class three perforations are in, seen in increasing frequency, but mortality has trended lower. With those patients who are at increased risk tended to have be female, have hypertension, CKD, or prior cabbage. Most commonly were caused from distal wire exit, balloon dilation catheters. 25% were treated with um, covered stents, about 28% were treated with balloon tamponade. Emergency cardiac surgery was only needed in 17%. Overall, one in 250 P uh, PCIs resulted in a coronary perforation. Knowing how to treat them, though, is key. Predicting paraprocedural complications in CTO PCI, the progress CTO complication scores, anytime we put a patient on the table for CTO intervention, knowing what the risks are of different complications are important. Within this paper, different uh, models were created to look at risk for MACE, mortality, pericardiosynthesis, and acute MI. And out of those uh, different uh, counting, um, uh, putting points towards each thing would add up to be what your risk profile could be. For MACE um, example here, we got one point if you're over 65, another point for moderate to severe calcium or a blunt stop or if ADR was used, and then two points if you're a female or retrograde. <laughs> Anytime we do PCI, there's always risk that we can cause kidney injury from contrast. So learning how to use do low contrast PCI is important, particularly when doing just routine PCI. So in the times of emergency cases, we use less. This particular paper looked at emergency versus elective PCI and found uh, we're looking for the difference um, in long-term outcomes. Ultimately, the incidence of post-contrast AKI was significantly higher after emergency PCI than after elective PCI, and excess mortality of post-contrast AKI was relative to no um, post-contrast AKI was greater after emergent PCI. Then when it comes to strokes and, and PCI, in this paper, um, looked at acute ischemic stroke and TIA in STEMI patients undergoing primary PCI, and ultimately um, bared it down to several different risk factors that can increase your rate, uh, risk of having one of these complications. Those being if a patient presented with cardiogenic shock, new onset atrial fibrillation, transfemoral approach if you've used over four catheters in the procedure, or if you had Mark II uh, type three or four bleeding. Anytime we use MCS, it helps us dramatically during procedures, but there can be risks involved in it. This um, uh, case report was a device fracture that was published in the European Heart, Heart Journal case reports. And ultimately, an impella was advanced um, for successful PCI. Patient did great. And then the impella was attempted to be removed at bedside. Um, in doing so, there was some what they defined as persistent mechanical resistance preventing retraction. <laughs> And um, upon removal, the whole device did not come out. They took the patient down to um, the cath lab and the fluoroscopy demonstrated that a portion of it had fractured off. Again, knowing how to get um, in and trapped equipment out is important. This one was simply removed as successfully with snaring. And then anytime we do PCI, closure devices, they're wonderful. They get patients up and moving quicker, but they don't go without risk at times and being mindful of this. A uh, patient that also underwent um, large bore access for PCI 
had had a, um, a Manta closure device placed with persistent bleeding. Um, this was created complications and ultimately ended up going for urgent surgical intervention. And it was found upon um, opening that the lateral aspect of the femoral artery failed to oppose the collagen from the Manta device, um, preventing sealing and um, as a result of the calcium that they had. So anytime we're doing PCI at any point in the game, we can have complications just knowing how to bail yourself out. But ultimately, purposeful practice is the key to preventing complications. Never fear asking for help, but ultimately we need to strive to do better each time we do PCI. Thank you. Rihanna, I can't believe you put this talk within the last 20 minutes. That's amazing. That's really nothing short of amazing. Um, and and, uh, and Carl, if there are any questions from the audience, you don't have a microphone here, so just raise up your hand and I'll come over and give you the microphone, okay? So anybody in the audience have a question? I, I just got to tell you one of my experiences, if you guys can mull about your questions, if you have for Rian. Um, <clears throat> the NTSB, National uh, Transportation Safety Board, investigate every, every accident. I was able to go and find the report for Andrea Grunzik, uh, accident that killed him and killed his wife. And I, I could tell like with complete details what was the weather, what, what, what happened, and how, what, the, what his conversation. And we do a really poor job at that. And uh, we start finally talking about the complication because we did not, of course, to my right here is the, the, uh, the guy who started a whole course about complication for two days, and I think by that course, we probably increase the safety significantly. Yeah, if I may add, Cal, um, there's really one way to avoid complication, and is not to do the case. So if you do case and you do enough, you're gonna get complication, yeah? There's no way around it. But what I realized helps a lot is to accept the fact that you do have a complication in front of you. Like, it is a grieving process, yeah? So there's first a denial phase, and then you, you know, the anger phase, bargaining, and then acceptance comes forth. So if you can pass that quickly, and if you see a dissection, instead of injecting more, getting more views, it's a dissection, is dissection, the osseal dissection. No more injection, I was do the right thing for the patient, get out of there. So the faster you get to that point, hopefully you get yourself out of trouble sooner. So I think, again, that's something I've learned uh, over time. So having my own uh, share of complications. So I guess, uh, J.A. or Rianne, whoever wants to take it, talk to me about how you learn from complications in a healthy way so that the outcomes are not what they've historically been. How have you gotten better, or are you better at managing them? I and how would you tell the people in the room are gonna go out and all of them are gonna have a complication in the next year? Who knows which one? So how do you help them prepare for that, and how did you learn to, to improve on that? I can say from personal experience, you know, um, when I had my first perforation on my own, it's a matter of asking for help. I, um, my, I had a partner scrub in with me right away and kind of work through the algorithm of putting a, a wire across, balloon it, and um, sealing it off, and then determining what my next steps were, whether it was to tap the patient or to put a covered stent there, um, whatever it may be. But every time uh, you have a complication, it's a matter of kind of reviewing back as to where you could have improved it, where you could learn something new to have prevented it, and ultimately, uh, coming up with an algorithm for whether it's prevention or for treatment. Jay, we, we talked a little bit about this in Seattle. Talk to me about managing fear, gaining experience to overcome fear. Um, it's interesting that you bring that up because that's the one thing I've noticed with all of our uh, younger CTO chip operators who've gone through formal training. It, it's impressive to see how quickly they can advance their skill set and um, they, they've been able to do this sort of on, on the, uh, the, the experience of, of more senior operators, and, and I think that that's fabulous. And it's actually helped me uh, watching my junior partners and how, how uh, confident they are approaching these things. And they're actually, <clears throat> in, any, in a lot of ways, a little bit more open to accepting some of the consequences of the procedure because they've seen more senior people know how to get them out of it. And I think that that's the one thing that... Uh, I think has really kind of helped me understand and accept, particularly your course, uh, where you show people that these things will happen, and these are the algorithms, these are the steps that you can take to get out of them. So the junior people, they, they've watched us do this, 
And sometimes the senior people are at a disadvantage because we haven't seen all these different things. And going to these courses and discussing these things in the meetings to come up with game plans for how to get out of these things, it can take some of that fear out. And when it happens, you can be a little bit more uh, reflective on what to do different next time uh, because you're equipped with what to do with it when it does happen. That, that's, that's how I've dealt with this. Jen, what I, what I usually tell my fellows is, you know, you have to learn to be comfortable feeling uncomfortable. Um, and, and the more cases you do, um, the more you show them um, how to treat these complications. They will learn that complications will come, but uh, no panic, uh, feel uncomfortable, but be okay with that. Ashish, when you're planning a case, are you thinking, I'm gonna do X, Y, Z, and it's gonna turn out great? Or are you thinking, if this doesn't work, or if this bad thing happens, so are you doing, are you looking more at the positive of way it's gonna turn out? Or do you look at it more in the, I'm preparing for all the disasters up front? I mean, obviously the answer is preparing for the worst and uh, happy that nothing of that happens. But I think I wanted to make three points. The first point is, one of the questions that you asked, I think, Rian or Jay, is how do you overcome fear? The overcoming of fear happens up front when the indication for the procedure is appropriate. You have full and informed decision making with the patient and the family a great relationship going into the case. And what happens after the case is two things. One, you don't want to be having what we call cognitive dissonance, where you don't learn at all from the case and think that, oh my God, if you do enough cases, stuff's going to happen, like what you just heard. That is the exact wrong approach. What you have to look at is, what could I have done differently and what have I learned constructively from this event so that it doesn't bite me in the future? And that is the healthy process of learning and improving when you experience a complication. Stop playing the second victim. Don't be cognitively dissonant. Don't fear the complication. Have a plan to deal with it. As JFK said, an error becomes, becomes a mistake when you don't learn from it. Perfect. You want to present? Uh, There's a question. question from the audience. Thank you. Well, I was just going to make a comment that uh, I feel like one of the best practices, if you have the uh, luxury of having multiple interventionalists, is that when there's a complication, we always try to bring in another interventionalist. Because, you know, part of being comfortable with being uncomfortable, I mean, that's easy said, it's not always done. You're, you're, as the primary operator, I find I'm always a bit emotionally involved when I've you know, been in part of a complication. And so when I look back on what I've done, sometimes I think, ah, I shouldn't have done that as an immediate reaction with a complication. It's because you're emotionally charged up. And so having a colleague there, or if, I'm, if I see my colleague have a complication, I try to always scrub in because you'll have a little different emotional vantage point to that procedure than the primary operator. I'd, I would give that a plus and minus. Having another operator help is great if they are actually helpful. We all know people that come in the room and are less than helpful. We also know people at m and that are less than helpful. So getting the right person in the room and having the communication about who's going to handle what before you get in the room can be very valuable. Um, the second thing that I wanted to say that just flashed right out of my head because I'm getting old, is, I can't remember, it'll come back to me later. I think to, to, add, to just to uh, piggyback what Bill said, when you get a second person in the room, I think that's, that's fine, but that person should have a well-defined role. So for example, if you're telling him to get transvenous access, or you're telling him to, to monitor the hemodynamics, or manage acid base, or put in a piggy a ping pong guide. That person should have a clearly defined role. What I don't like is somebody walking into the room standing next to you and just sort of making comments that are potentially distracting but of no real benefit. So uh, help is, uh, is help as, uh, as long as it's adding value to you during your crisis. And I, I remembered. So remember that most everyone lives in a silo. You've practiced in the same place, it's the same group, you tend to have group think. The other is, does anybody there actually have more expertise in this than anybody else? 
Just because you've been doing something for a long time does not actually mean you have expertise, okay? So don't be afraid when you have a complication to get an outside expert who actually has expertise to talk you through the process, the learning objectives, and getting better. Uh, um, this was stated at, at the complication course a year ago, and it's really important, and that's what this is about. It is actually okay for me to have a complication that leads to death. It is not okay that everyone else in the room makes the exact same mistake with the exact same death. So we need to be much more open to learning, learning from others, so that we do not repeat the same mistakes of others, but actually effectively learn from it to improve our ability to take care of patients. With that, you want me to introduce the next yeah. speaker? Great. So Amar Ali, Alita? Amar, what is it? Alighty. I, the last person, I, should, I can barely speak English, so I apologize. Um, we're going to look at the closed vessel. So until Amr al Aiti, Amr al Aiti gets. <laughs> Good job, Cal. Good job. <laughs> Thank you so much. And Go ahead. Thank for the translation. So let's keep going here. Okay, 77 year old male with uh, NSTEMI, unstable angina, normal EF, two vessel disease. We, after it being turned down actually for uh, surgery, uh, we proceeded with PCI. This is the diagnostic uh, image of the RCA. Uh, so obviously the best way to avoid complications is actually to really predict what can happen based on anatomy. So here, if I'll get everybody attention. There is severe disease in the proximal RCA that looks like to me is the primary target for, uh, for PCI. There is significant tortuosity in the mid-distal RCA. And there is, seem to be a lesion there. So proceeding with the PCI for, uh, for this vessel, uh, I think a decision needs to be made, like do I fix the proximal lesion first and then look, evaluate the distal one, mid-distal one? Uh, usually, I, like probably everyone else, uh, you don't want to um, put stain the proximal vessel and then tackle the mid-distal. Uh, but you never say never, and what we did, we actually did proceed with the proximal uh, PCI, of, uh, proximal vessel, RCA here, with direct scenting and post dilatation. Uh, the thought process was that if you, you have to pre-dilate this lesion to evaluate the mid-distal vessel, right? And if you play that late, many times you might end up with dissection and then compromise the flow distally and then become difficult to tackle the mid-distal lesion. I'm gonna just pause for a second here and see if anybody, anybody had any like idea or objection to this approach or want to say something. Yeah, I just had two comments. One, uh, in general, uh, do not advocate direct stenting, period, number one, because I think that size of that stent is probably undersized, number two, uh, the point you made about treating of distal uh, after treating the proximal is highly discouraged. I think that paradigm may have changed in, with the advent of uh, guide extension therapies. Uh, the, the other thing, when you have a vessel like this, uh, first of all, I don't go radial. Second, I use AL1. And third, I use H French guide. Because this is just if you go uh, I, uh, if you go in radial with the JR4, you ask him for trouble. That's my opinion. Perfect. So, totally agree. No direct stenting without imaging. So I direct stent all the time if I image before it, and that's what we did in for the proximal vessel. The radial. This is Icardi right guide, uh, six inch, and. The patient had actually severe PAD, and we were actually, if you see there's a wire in the uh, ureter ready for it to put a, some assist device in case of complication. Uh, but the, I don't go six inch radial unless I have papyrus. So for sure, going in cases like that, I always ask for what cover stents we have, kind of guesstimate the size of the vessel and make sure I have the enough length and size of covered stent. 
because of you know tortuosity that we tackling there. So, so now we pick the proximal vessel, and we think we optimize the proximal uh, uh, stent. Now I'm doing OCT for the distal vessel, and loss of blood flow here. So obviously, you have to have a quick differential of what could be going on, right? And the quick differential in my mind always is it wire pleating because you know we have a catheter and wire now in the tortuous vessel. Is it spasm? Is it embolization? Is it dissection? It's straining. Garden hose effect. You strain in the vessel, you shut it down, right? Yeah. So basically, it could be dissection though. Hmm? It could be dissection, right? And it could be dissection. So right now, the option is obviously you look clinically how the patient is doing. There's no significant ST elevation, no chest pain. We basically proceeding. I pulled, the, I pulled the catheter thinking like, okay, maybe this will get better. And it did a little bit, so kind of suggesting maybe this wire depleting uh, more than anything else. Obviously, you make sure your hairpin is good, your ACT is good, you haven't done anything else that could have caused this. I mean, which wire is this? Sorry to ask. Uh, Long through wire. This is your workhorse wire, Yes, right? yes. The problem is that OCT showed this in that tortuous segment. And if anybody not familiar with OCT, this is severe calcification that kind of really, you know, thick calcium here, this is the uh, caliber. And if you see this, this is unmistakably calcium node. So this is severe, thick calcification in a tortuous vessel now that we stented the proximal vessel. So yeah, it, ma it really kind of um, meets the criteria for atherectomy. So I'm gonna pause here for a second also and see what if anybody has anything to say about this. Now we have severe calcification in tortuous vessel that I actually cannot see well with angiogram because of possibly wire depleting. So my option, pulling the wire and they assess everything, stop or proceed with something. Audience, if you, if you have any opinion, if you want to say something, please. How many people would stop, pull the wire back, and see what happens? How many would grab CSI or rotoblader and go to work? do a pullback that way as well. That might take away some of the tortuosity, but I, I don't know if I would use that image in with that angio to pull out a rotoblader or, or CSI. When you when you pull the wire, you leave the, the yeah, soft part. you just part. leave the OCT catheter and do a pullback. Yeah, I think that that's an important point. When you say pull the wire, you're pulling back to the soft part of the wire. You're not pulling the wire. You, right. you, can, you can do it either way, as long as you have the OCT pullback on it, right? You can leave the soft part, part in and do the pullback, but I've also just pulled it in an extremely tortuous vessel and just done the OCT pullback, and then it would give you a lot more of a better blood flow clearance. I would never actually pull the, OC, the wire and leave the OCT catheter. It's very flimsy. And but, tortuous. but it takes away the tortuosity, which may be causing that. that yeah, but then, but then talk about like complications, that's where, you, <laughs> you know, if you pull on it and it's, it's Tortuous vessel calcified. Actually, going in with the OCT was adventure. Even like you had to put guideline all the way in. It's very tortuous. Very difficult to navigate. But, but you haven't predilated or caused any. No, no. Yeah, exactly. Distally, so, distally. So rewiring the vessel shouldn't be necessary. Yeah, no. I worry more about actually leaving the OCT and getting stuck and breaking it apart because it was very flimsy. So um, let's ask an audience question. How many people, with a show of hands, would do what uh, this gentleman suggested here, which is basically not just pull the wire back, the soft part, but essentially lose distal wire control, have an OCT catheter, and pull it back to be able to sort out whether or not this is a real lesion or not, show of hands. Or how many think that this is uh, outside their comfort? So I think we, we need to move along. The point I'll make out to everybody is everyone's decision is based on their own internal narrative and it's based totally on your ability to manage a coronary dissection. Because that's the, of the, the things on your list, that's the only one that terrifies people. So I'd love to see what you do next. Yeah, so, and just one more point about artifact. Absolutely, you will need to make sure that this is not artifact, but I'm 100% confident this is calcium node and severe calcification. So based on the feeling that this is straight in the wire and this is more wire pleating, 
we actually had to proceed. I, I, I think either stop or do a thelectomy. I don't think there's other choice. I don't think um, uh, lithotripsy will be an option here because you're choosing them between massive perforation and, and bad dissection and difficulty even getting the balloon in. So yeah, 1.5 bar um, did not activate the bar until through the stent, and the stent was optimized proximally. Uh, so now the final, you know, we're able to go through this uh, lesion after multiple attempts, and now, obviously, I didn't uh, show you the angiogram because I didn't do angiogram, I just do a puff in this situation. There's ST elevation and there is chest pain. So now, you know, obviously, I'm more worried about the dissection, right? Um, and uh, I did not do angiogram because I don't think it's gonna be helpful if my angiogram with the wire only wasn't very helpful. This, if it is dissection, it might just propagate. So the question is, what do you do now? Well, I think the question I'd ask you is, you have four potential etiologies. Have you yet to figure out which one it is? Because right now we don't know what you're treating. So as you're sitting in the case, how are you algorithmically, how are you thinking through, I'm gonna manage which of these problems? Yeah, and that's what the next slide is. So basically, obviously spasm, we, we, we make sure we, we're giving nitro all the time if the patient is stable, right? Uh, make sure you're helping all the time, your ACT, your therapeutic anticoagulation, you know, on board for sure all the time. Uh, going into this case, I was worried obviously about perforation versus dissection. And, this is not perforation, obviously the dissection is the concern. The question is, did I propagate the dissection distally, way distal? I, we don't know, we're not gonna know. You can think about doing IVIS uh, because you don't need contest for that, but I did not think that would be helpful. I kind of proceeded with my algorithm that I was ready to do. Remember, I did OCT, it was obstructive. I can't see distally very well, but I'm able to actually determine the length of my stent and my proximal landing zone. If I know my proximal landing zone and the length, and uh, then, then I'm just gonna proceed with my stenting and then see what happens next. So we chose the stent, um, delivered it based on the OCT, you can see the proximal landing zone, and then proceeded with uh, post-dilatation, you know, landing the stent here, post-dil, using guideline all the way in because it's very tortuous, and then take an angio then with OCT, and then I can basically recover the flow. That tells me that there was a dissection, but localized to the area that I was planning to stent anyway. Um, and now it's the safest way to kind of see if there's distal dissection, we can tackle it. But there was none. And then you can see now the, how the vessel was straightened. Just to give you an idea, six months or several months later, you know, we bring the patient back for something else, but this is the vessel without the wire and without the equipment. Um, and looks good, but this is the, you know, teaching lesson of trying to deal with the tortuous vessel and get ready for what can happen and not, you know, and, and have just algorithm how to approach it. Amr, we need, uh, we need to kind of move faster because we're running out of time. Are you done? This is your last I, slide. I'm done. Perfect. <laughs> I was going to ask if you have any question because that's we good. still have a couple of minutes. Uh, yeah, that, that's good. So for the discussion, uh, th this is really like, it's you commended because you did not lose sight of what you're going to do and you kept going and you treated the patient and you took care of the uh, complications. Uh, but um, uh, what kind of lessons, uh, let's start from uh, Jay, what do you think we uh, should kind of take from this case? Well, you know, one question I have actually for you is, the, you know, the OCT requires an injection, right? You have to flush out the, contra the blood to see. And if you have dissection in your differential, I mean, how do, you, how do you deal with that whole conflict? No, that's a perfect question. So I actually did not do OCT after I suspected dissection. I did it when, you remember when the initial image I'm showing you, this loss of distal flow, that was OCT that I, then I did pre doing anything. But so you had a run that you used to mark your proximal landing zone, no? Or did I not understand that correctly? So there was, no, there, I was able to see the proximal landing zone. I was able to see- On the original run. On the, or on the original one, on the one that before I doing a thelectomy. The one I that would have definitely me. put an IVIS probe down there to try to mark where the landing zone was. Yeah, I, I, I think the, the, for sure the teaching lesson is use some sort of imaging to kind of help you guide. But I did not want for sure to use more contest and more angio if there is differential dissection. I did not personally feel that IVIS will help me because I already had the OCT. My plan will be, you know, 
tackle the, the, the possible dissection that was there and stent it. But I think for sure IVUS would have been an option. At least you make sure your dissection did not propagate too distal. So. Constantinos, um, any comments? Well, I was just wondering, um, you know, with the workhorse wire and, you know, that area there, do you feel that the wire went smoothly? I'm just wondering, because the fact that you felt comfortable doing, you know, like a rotational atherectomy, that tells me that the wire, you know, probably went pretty smoothly. Uh, used microcatheter to be able to navigate, actually. It wasn't, it wasn't very smooth. It felt like a tortuosity and calcium, but I, again, I'm against feeling it. Like you see how the case is actually moving, but because, you know, but, but for sure it was difficult to wire. Rotoing through a fresh dent too always makes me a little anxious. So did you put a guide extension down through that fresh dent then to get it, the rotational threatening down to the distal vessel? No, I couldn't because the very choice I used was 1.5 and I don't think it would go easy with the, mm -hmm. through the guide extension. Obviously, if you were using larger guide up front, then for sure. Uh, but, but yeah, no, I mean, again, this is not something we planned on using. This was surprise because angiographically, it did not look heavily calcified for sure. And I'm glad we did imaging to be honest because if we were just trying to tackle this without imaging, this could have been dissection and perforation at the same time with that calcium node that I showed you. I'm not. Um, I, I feel I, I, I'm with you. I felt really a lot of trepidation when I saw the bird going. However, like obviously. Uh, uh, um, has an impeccable technique because um, if you do really good technique, you probably, as he showed, got away with it, right? <clears throat> I, I would like to, I'm Lou Cole, I'm clearly not Jackie Saw. Um, I would like to kind of echo your call for more imaging. This would be a really interesting case to have a non-invasive CT beforehand that would answer your question about the burden of calcium. And if your lab has non-invasive CTFFR, you can maybe know in advance whether that distal torturous lesion is hemodynamically significant or not. Totally change your plan up front. I'm um, just reflecting on you know, learning from cases and stuff. So going back to this case and what you learned from this case, how would you approach it differently from the get-go? Would you still consider direct stenting for the distal portion first? Would you image it? Just walk us through now you learn from this case, how would you approach it? So to be honest, like obviously, I didn't want to plan to do a thectomy through flesh stent, but my, my, my concern was that if I don't stent proximal, even like if you just, obviously you have to predilate, right? So if you predilate proximal lesion, you, you, you're not gonna end up you know, with great flow, possibly, possibly. You might lose the flow you know, all the way to the distal vessel and you might not see well. But yes, of course. I mean, if I image that area first, somehow predilate the proximal lesion, see if I'm able to do good run of OCT, and make sure I didn't need a thectomy distally before I stand proximally, for sure that's what I would prefer. This came as surprise, not total surprise to be honest, because the LED was calcified, but clearly calcified. This one was not. So I agree with you, if, you, like if you're well prepared, if you have CT or something that Helpful, you cannot do it in every case, unfortunately. And this was not one of Thanks, them. Thanks, Amr. We're going to have to move to the next case. Thank uh, you. I, it's, uh, I have the honor of uh, uh, presenting uh, the next uh, complication case. I perforated the vessel. Uh, Dr. Homan, uh, Homan Khalil. All right. <clears throat> All right. Thank you. I have no relevant disclosures. All right. The 85-year-old female who uh, presented with complaints of chest pain and dyspnea, well, lateral perfusions, hadn't really seen anybody in a while. EF was 25%, RB function was also reduced. She was diabetes. She was having actually chest pain that required nitroglycerin infusion. These are her uh, previous histories, uh, heavy history of smoker. These are diagnostic angios. Um, and project that well, maybe, I don't know if you guys can see. This is a left main disease, heavily calcified, proximal, um, 
uh, sorry, uh, distal left main and approximate LAD disease, heavily calcified, both of them. Also diffuse distal LAD disease as well. So fairly calcified um, left main and LAD. Uh, she was evaluated actually by, she was turned out by one surgeon and evaluated by another surgeon. Both uh, obviously turned her down. She was actually, they discussed palliative care well, with the patient. Well. the picture you showed has a pigtail and a pericardium? No, so um, great observation. So she had, uh, she came in with pleural effusion, so that was a pleurex catheter for pleural oh, okay. effusion, yep. All right. Looked Not weird. yet. <laughs> Not, Not yet, no. obvious. Uh, <laughs> um, so um, so the, the, uh, she came, and so after t much discussion and being turned down by two surgeons, we decided to proceed uh, with uh, uh, these, I don't know if you guys can see the images, it, projecting a little, uh, with a lot of contrast, but um, we decided to proceed uh, with uh, PCI. Uh, Shockwave was not available at the time in our institution, so uh, we went ahead with uh, Rotablator, um, and IVUS actually could not be advanced initially. Well, so when can I just interrupt? One second. Go so ahead, sorry. Just a quick yeah. comment. Uh, the motion of the heart looks suspect to begin with, and it would be very helpful before the impeller goes in to know what her filling pressures were. So just as a learning point for the people in the room that uh, the right heart and optimizing her before you bring her to the lab is an extremely vital step before you just go straight into something as complex as this. Yes, no, that's fair enough. She was, she was in the hospital for, for quite a while and was diaries for quite a bit, but that's, that's a fair point. So um, she, uh, anyways, we went ahead with a 1.5 millimeter burr a rotablator uh, was able to uh, do an intravascular ultrasound after the root ablation uh, to kind of get the estimate of the reference vessel diameters. Uh, 4.0 millimeter balloon, you'll see that I think on the, on the right side. These are the angios subsequent to that. And this is after we implanted a stent. Um, so this was a, again, a four millimeter balloon and four millimeter uh, stent extending from a proximal LAD into the left main. And you guys, I'm sure, see that perforation. Uh, initially hard to see where exactly it was coming from after much projection, some of these images here. Um, it looked like it was coming from osteo LAD. Uh, perhaps some from the proximal as well, but osteo LAD was uh, what it felt like the perforation was coming from. So what do you all think? Quick other question, how does the right look? I see a circ that has some branches, but is the right dominant? The right is dominant, yep. And undiseased? Undiseased, yes. And no disease, right? No disease, yes. So osteal, osteal LAD perforation, right? Yes. So um, what did you do next? Okay, <laughs> all right. Yes, so we did IVUS before. I don't have the images, but like I said, the reference vessel diameter was 4.0 millimeter in the LAD. The left main was larger, it was 50 millimeter. So you're saying head to head. Yes, yes. Trail on the outside, trail on the inside. The perforations will happen. It's yeah. more about how do you get yourself out of this? Yes. What do we need to learn to be, do our job better? So, I mean, the first thing, so this is the uh, Monis' uh, algorithm. So, first thing first, occlude the vessel, stop the perforation, right? So, you inflate the balloon to occlude the vessel, uh, assess the hemodynamics, get echocardi uh, echocardiography in a room to evaluate for pericardial effusion, and uh, if need be, notify the surgeon. So, we went through all these steps. Balloon was uh, placed to occlude, uh, distal left main to the LAD. The surgeon was notified, echocardiogram was done. There was uh, no pericardial effusion on the echo. Hemodynamically, she was doing okay. At this time, there was no need for uh, intravenous uh, pressors. The balloon was up for about five to 10 minutes. So the, the previous picture gives you some help. So, when dye on? stains around a perforation, it has to be staining on something that tends to be epicardial fat. If you've ever gone to the OR, a lot of places in the heart, there's fat laying over. So if you're lucky with the hole, 
the hole is near a bunch of fat. And fat is very thrombogenic. So sometimes just prolonged balloon inflation will get it to seal. The question for you now is, is it actually sealed and how are you gonna prove that? So, um, one thing I did in this case was I waited and to see what, uh, what she's gonna do. So I, didn't, I held up the balloon for about five, 10 minutes and just waited and watched it for about 10 more minutes, did injections intermittently to evaluate. Um, she looked like she was doing fine. Amon, when it, yes, let sorry. me ask you this. When you held the balloon, did yeah. you occlude the left main, including the circuit? Yes, I had to. You had to. I so had to. including the LED. So what I did in a situation like this, I occluded the LED alone and I injected to see where is my perf. Is it starting in the left main or not? Yeah. And of course, if it starts, there is a technique for that. Yeah. yeah. One of the things I noticed and anecdotally, yes. when uh, we perforate the, LED, the, the left main or close to the left main, for some reason, there is not like a massive bleeding because probably there is a lot of mass of fat in there. And I've, like anecdotally, that a couple of times happened in this situation and it, the left main tend to kind of stop. <clears throat> the so I, so, sorry, sorry to interrupt. The point no. that I think Bill was trying to make is, is what is the objective assessment of continued bleeding and what he was, I think, referring to is just for the audience is potentially using some form of a contrast agent to confirm that there's no ongoing bleeding into the pericardium. That's why, although waiting is not unreasonable, but getting yes. that ready as your next step is, the, is your yes. definitive answer before you send this lady to the floor. And there is a right heart catheterization now, yep. which, which is commendable because this is how we also know if you have tampon yeah, on. That's right. Whatever. So, um, so let's say that um, this, she did, does open up the perforation again. My concern was, uh, and the surgeon was there, my concern was if this perf opens up again and he fails to tampon out off with a balloon, what am I going to do next? Because this will require a cover stent into the left main. I'm going to close up the cirque. Now, granted, it's, not a, it's a non-dominant cirque, but nonetheless, that was the thought process in my head. If that's going to be an issue, is that going to be too much of ischemia for her since she already has a low EF? And so for the audience and potentially for yourself, the purpose of practice next year is you can fenestrate a covered stent. You can actually culotte papyrus. Cal's actually the first one to demonstrate it. So if you've never done it, I know Kevin Crows did this on a kitchen table. I highly recommend you learn how to do a culotte of a covered stent because you've got to be okay covering the branch and rescuing the branch. Unless that's what you did and I just stole your thunder, so I'm sorry. Yeah, I had a slide on it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, you, Homan, you, you have to go over the technique, how you did it. Yeah, well, yeah. Well, not that I did it, but I, I did put a slide on that, uh, the whole idea. Um, so, she did open up again. After about 10 minutes, perforation opened up again. Um, and hemodynamically, she started becoming and, unstable. And, and that's because you had to keep her out of coagulated because the impella and the gear. Yes, yep, exactly. Um, I did not want to reverse her, yes. Wow. So, um, so she opened up again, I had to put a balloon back up again. I don't have those images. And that was just too much ischemia for her. RV function started to go down as well. We had a uh, swan gans catheter there. We also had an echocardiogram you can see on the echo. Um, Why and, the RV function went down? I, I, you know, hard to know. I mean, I think overall just the fact that she, she started with an EF of 20%. Her RV function to be start off with mildly depressed, I think just global ischemia. Um, but I, I, I'm not sure, quite sure. I know. It's just ventricular interdependence. Yeah. Ultimately, all LV failure leads to RV failure, and yeah. the lesser reserve you have on the left side, the faster that happens. Yeah, yeah because the, 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 the ventricle actually depends on the septum, right? Yeah. 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 So um, ended up putting a RP impellant as well in her, and again, balloon, a balloon tampon audited it. It looked like he stopped, and 10 minutes later, again, opened up again. So, um, talking about having other folks in the room to help you out, somebody suggested maybe just leave the balloon in there overnight and see what happens. Uh, not a helpful suggestion, so no. I decided not to do that. So, um, Unless you had a ringer. 
The, ring, the Ringer balloon yes. is actually a perfusion balloon. Perfusion you can balloon, leave yeah. it for an hour or two. Yeah. We've done that. We enrolled the first nine patients in the trial, and they would not allow us to enroll anymore. And every other center have not enrolled much, <laughs> much because we expert in perforation, obviously. <laughs> so unfortunately, yeah, we did not have access to that perfusion balloon. So at this point, have to do a cover stent. Uh, I think there was uh, no question about it. Had to go, um, proceed. Uh, this was pre graphmaster um, sorry papyrus we didn't have access to papyrus with the graphmaster i thought about it can, is it possible that i can fenestrate it but i don't think it's possible is it no yes this is possible is it possible that actually the first time i did it it was a graphmaster okay gotcha but so, you have uh, to use astato 20 mm -hmm. and if it doesn't work you can actually do bovi so and which basically uh, uh build it so uh, this is uh, what Dr. Lombardi was talking about, is that papyrus fenestration. It would have been uh, you know, an idea of doing that, um, of stenting across and just fenestrating with the high tip load uh, wire. Uh, but uh, in my case, I just went ahead and stented across the circumflex. Again, uh, didn't have access to papyrus and didn't, have, didn't know that you can actually fenestrate a, a, a graft master either. The other thing you could do is an SKS. I hate that technique. I think it's horrible. But in this situation, the risk of ischemia is probably greater. And at this point, you're just trying to get out of the room. And if this 85-year-old lives long enough to get restenosis, you can figure that out later. So I don't recommend almost ever. But the one situation where if you're in a hurry, you're scared, and you don't know how to do it, take a pair of covered stents. You can do it with ping pong guides even and do an SKS. It's the fastest way out of trouble. Go ahead, Herman. Uh, OK. <laughs> So uh, again, echo, no percarial effusion in her. Um, she still, she was able, we were able to get her off the, uh, out of the room to the ICU, but her clinical status continued to deteriorate subsequently. We left the swan cast catheter in her. And I think that gave us the answer when she made it to the ICU. Her filling pressures were dropping, which didn't make sense, except, um, a chest x-ray then showed a new left-sided pleural effusion that turned out to be a hemothorax. So she was bleeding her left lung as well. I uh, remember she had, a, she had a pleural catheter there uh, a few days prior for, um, uh, for transitive effusion from heart failure. I'm not sure if that was a trigger in the setting of having blood thinners on board. You know, she was not doing well on the table, uh, coagulopathic, and something might have popped open at that point. So. Uh, but that, she, she, did not do, she did not make it out of hospital after this. Uh, it was just too much for her, and she unfortunately passed away. That's, that's very brave of you, and we really thank you for yeah. presenting this case because this is how short normally it goes. Nobody, you know, we all show our yes. spectacular save, but that's actually the minority in these cases. Right. But, I mean, uh, the algorithm from, it, from the perforation standpoint, I think it's, it's, you know, following the steps of making sure to having a balloon inflated to occlude the vessel, test out whether or not you were able to tap or not, and then get everybody on board, echocardiogram, surgeon, and, of course, if it all fails, uh, for a major vessel uh, perforation, cover stent, and all the techniques that you all pointed out for uh, left main and osseal LAD, uh, very helpful. Great, great presentation, a lot for everybody to learn from. I think, you know, the, the, the take homes I would wrap up with is in an 85 year old who's really ill, potentially be a little more, less aggressive about your stent sizing. We sort of talk about this since we do a lot of this hybrid stuff to avoid these situations. That if they live long enough to get re stenosis, we can deal with it. You know, risk adjustment sometimes is just get them out of the hospital. Number two, I think it's important to think about anticoagulation. Um, number three, the more proximal you are in a vessel, the more likely you can get into the mediastinal reflections or into the aortic walls. So you can have bleeding that's not in the pericardium, so identifying where the blood is going is critical. And then if you don't know how to do SKS with covered stents and you don't know how to do a culotte with covered stents, that is a great place to go home and do some purposeful practice. So that when invariably this situation comes up, big diagonal, distal PLPDA, you have a better set of skills to give you a better chance because unfortunately people who are this sick have almost no margin for error and are very intolerant of anything going wrong, unfortunately. So wonderful case. Thank you so much for presenting it. I, I actually want to ask, ask Rianne 
uh, about the te can you go over when within like 30 seconds the technique how would you deploy a covered stent in a left main into the LED and what would you do to ensure that you can get back in the circ? So um, this is where guide extensions are really critical. So you, you want to make sure that you have, uh, if you're able to get a secondary access and use ping pong guides, great. If not, because either access issues or a patient is um, unwell and it's going fast. You have your wire down, you have your balloon that's occluding. You want to be quick in kind of facilitating re-advancement of a fresh balloon and a guide extension and deliver the guide extension over the segment that you're going to deliver your papyrus to. And then you're going to drop that balloon, pull it out, exchange it for your papyrus. You're going to watch it go into the back end of your guide extension because if, a, if you're going to lose the um, covered stent, it's probably going to be back there. And you're going to watch it go through the guide extension and then land um, successfully at the spot that you want to deploy it. Longer is always better for um, covered stents. So um, they come in usually three different sizes, but choosing the 26 um, millimeter length is more ideal if you're able to and you're not risking losing a lot of side branches. I, I think Cal's question was how to do the culotte. Oh, so the simple way of that is put a wire in the circ, jail it with the covered stent. You lose the radio opaque portion of the wire in the circ as a marker. You come in with a microcatheter and a fairly sharp wire, puncture, microcatheter through, work or in and balloon it. And then if you need to cool out, you just do the process all over again the other direction. Again, there's, I'm sure Manos has videos of this and other people have videos of this, but it is an important skill to learn. It's really mean to put a covered stent across somebody's LAD and then expect somebody to come back three months later to fix the LAD, Rianne. I will be showing that tomorrow. You'll be showing that tomorrow. Thank you. Uh, but and by sharp wire, you mean Hornet 14? Hey, hey, the proton. Vlad, real quick. We're, yeah, we're running I just late, have so. a question for you. Why would you need to put a covered stent in your SKS? Why a covered stent also Could, into the uh, circuit? Because you're not you get, sure. You're not sure. The, it's, it may be at the media stunt. Yeah, you don't know where in the carina. Yeah. So in this case, if you put that in and it's sealed, the one thing I have done doing this is when I cool out it, we open it up again because you built flow. So you've got to be, I'm just saying, you have to be prepared. Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. Sometimes you just jailbreak it, but you need to be prepared that you have to do a cool out. That's prob all. The problem with the KISS stinting, there is a gutters between the stint going to continue to feed that perp. Yeah, but so only if you're desperate, because it could work. I don't know. Yeah. It, it, mine usually is cover, balloon it. You look. If, there's, if it's open and everything's great, cool. If not, then I'm just going to go to a quick cool out. Um, Usman, Bauer, you're stuck. Can you help get us unstuck? Okay. We'll all applaud right. at the end. We love him. It's all good. <laughs> Where is, uh, let me see this up here. Okay, so um, I'm going to tell you about a case that I had the, I guess, fortune or misfortune of taking care of. Uh, and thus far, it's an end of one for me in these types, and hopefully the last time I'll have to deal with this. So. This is a uh, patient who's 77 years old, uh, diabetic, um, has had multiple prior stents um, at different uh, facilities, and most notably has had multiple stents to the RCA, um, at least three stents, and we know uh, the last one prior to this presentation was about six months ago. The EF is preserved, um, EKG shows uh, sinus rhythm, ischemic changes, and he basically presents uh, to an outside hospital with this typical recurrent um, anginal symptoms, um, and he's taken there for an urgent cath. So uh, the diagnostic angio, you can see starting off on the left, uh, shows basically uh, nothing of significance there. There's an, uh, a stent in the circ that's widely patent. And the operator uh, at the referring facility then is trying to engage uh, the right and is having a lot of challenges. And um, you can appreciate right at the os of the RCA, there's a high-grade 99% lesion uh, within the body of a previously deployed stent. There's at least um, three stents in that prox to mid RCA. And uh, at this, uh, and, and you can see she's radial here and spending a lot of time and then takes a final kind of just cine at the, at the right. And you can probably appreciate there's double density indicating an area of overlap and a fair bit of uh, tortuosity um, and angulation of that final stent in the prox RCA extending into, um, into the aorta. 
Uh, we got some more history. It, looked, it turned out when the stent was deployed six months prior, the cath note stated that there was some quote-unquote instability at the time of deployment. We're not sure exactly what that was, but clearly led to a suboptimal, suboptimal deployment. Nonetheless, patient did well for six months until, until now. So um, at this point, um, uh, at, this, at this facility, there's no surgical backup. Uh, there's no OCT, a lot of other um, devices. So we get a call asking, would be, would, you know, is there something we could offer or try to do to help take care of this patient? So uh, they get a cardiac CT as well. And here you can see, just to kind of characterize things, uh, pretty clear what's, what's going on with the double layer. Um, and per the cardiac CT, we've got eight millimeters of stent uh, protruding into the aorta. So in our conversation, uh, we felt, well, we can bring the patient in. Um, we have surgical backup, um, and we can attempt uh, to try to remove this. Our initial plan was to bring the patient. Uh, we spoke to the patient, spoke to our surgeon, uh, and hopefully get a wire um, down the right. And if we could have a wire down the right, try to snare this with the wire protecting us. That was sort of the initial plan. Um, and patient was on board and uh, surgeon was on board. And if we got into trouble, uh, basically go for urgent single vessel bypass. Patient was quite symptomatic, although uh, not having positive troponins and no active EKG changes, basically couldn't walk from the bed to the, to the restroom without, without having chest pain. So that was our plan. Uh, we, uh, this was, uh, I didn't put his BMI here. This is a large guy, BMI about 38 to 40. Um, we go femoral, long sheath, uh, eight French system um, up front. Uh, we put in a transvenous pacer just in case we get into trouble with the right. So you can see that in the images here. And um, initially, uh, our, again, our plan was to wire this right. Um, we spent a lot of time exhausting, I think, most of the complement of guides, at least I had available in diagnostic catheters. and. Could not, uh, could not get a, uh, a wire down into this right. So at this point, I'm kind of stuck. Um, I have to make a decision if I'm gonna to try to snare this, uh, and this, again, this proximal stent is overlap with, with other stents. So we finally end up taking uh, an eight French multipurpose guide. Um, we initially take a, just an Amplatz gooseneck snare, and we're able to snare a piece of the stent out, but not the entire. We then take the end snare, the multi-loop, um, and use that, we get a lot better um, engagement with the proximal stent. Osman, oh, yeah. Osman, like, I, I think if you put a wire, you'll complicate your case. The, the reason is you cannot snare the stent with the wire in it, right? And you're going to end up with two guide catheters and a stent snared and holding on to the wire from two different axes. You're not going to be like, you're lucky you didn't wire it. Well, I was, I was. <laughs> Uh, my concern was if I pull this, you know, pull this back and there's, you know, he's going to just, just shut. go back. There is yeah. a, this little stent. You just go back and poke, poke at it. Um, I guess my concern was when I ripped this out, it was the whole, you know, vessel going to shut down and I'll have. You open no it protection. up again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that that's the, what many people do is they want protection of the coronary because they don't know how to manage coronary dissections well. That is a big flaw in our training. So I think you're doing, again, sort of where you are. Your concern is you're going to dissect it yeah. and not be able to get back. That's a place for you to do some purposeful practice over the next year is how do I learn to manage a flow obstructing coronary dissection? What are the techniques to get better? Stenectomy also is pretty easy, usually because these stents are almost always underdeployed. So I bet none of these were image guides. So I think so far you're great. I'm glad you got the stent out. Where do we go next? <laughs> yeah, so this was the challenge. So we got the stent out, so we felt pretty good. And then my, the concern is actually what ended up happening thereafter is the moment we got the stent out, we look at it, we, we're feeling pretty good. The patient's having a lot of chest pain, um, ST changes. Um, and uh, the challenge now is trying to get something that was somehow coaxial with, with this OS. And again, using a lot of different guiding catheters. So we start off, so you can remember our prior shot, we did have flow, although the osteal right was quite stenosed. We now have essentially complete closure of the vessel. Um, I cannot get anything really fully coaxial with it. Uh, finally, with an uh, AR1 guide, um, using a fielder wire and a microcatheter, I was able to 
finally get a wire uh, with microcatheter uh, support um, down to the distal. Um, don't show it here, but then we use a guide extender to get some more support, stiffer wire, and was able to balloon um, and finally deliver a stent and used a, uh, a wire in the, in the coronary cusps to mark the os so we hopefully don't get into the same problem that happened initially um, and deploy a, a 3-5 stent of a different, different type. And so we take this, this final picture here. So at least angiographically, we felt a lot better at this point, um, and we took some OCT images, both post uh, snaring and then, and then after. So on the left, uh, you can see once we got the stent material out uh, kind of in, the longi in the longitudinal at the bottom, you can see where the guide ends, you can see the os, and in the cross-sectional image in the upper right, you can see uh, obviously a lot of uh, bit of dissection and some plaque. And then on the right, you can see post-deployment, uh, the same exact area. So we've got a well-opposed and expanded stent. Um, and the patient uh, did well, uh, went home. We actually didn't do uh, this. Uh, we, we actually, he actually came back several months later just for kind of a relook, and, and he was doing well. And it's been about a year, and he's continues to do well with this primary care physician. Wonderful case. So a, a couple of comments. How many people have heard of OsteoFlash, the balloon? Okay, if you haven't, you can solve a big chunk of this with that device because it will flare open. The other question is, let's say you had gotten a wire in and for whatever reason you couldn't, it, you don't know where that wire comes in the stent because it's hanging out, right? It's probably actually yeah. five or six cells up. What could you have done different other than snaring it out? Well, I mean, if I can basically create a neo, um, go in with a wire, I can balloon and kind of create a new sort of os for the RCA going through the old, going through the old stent. Right, so cool Essentially off. exclude it. Cool on it, it exclude it, yep. exactly. I think that's, so there's two ways potentially to solve this yeah. problem, right? Yeah, osseoflush I don't have, and I tried, I just could not, no matter what I did, there was, I couldn't get a wire through a side strike, couldn't get it through. I, again, the, I want to, the point I'm trying to make, and this is a great case, this is not about what I did was right. These are about what are all of my solutions yeah. when it doesn't go right. So that's the reason I'm bringing it up. That's why I'm bringing up osteoflash. A lot of these things are, we're gonna show great cases where we solve problems and we do it. But if you have five solutions to a problem instead of one, you're more likely to be successful going forward. And that's really what, to me, this is about. It's the vulnerability of, okay, this was a great case. But what else can we learn from it? What can I take away? To, to improve. Another uh, tip that I learned recently about, if you do have osteoflash and you have that much metal sticking out, you can't just park the osteoflash at the mm -hmm. presumed ostium because it'll constrain that big balloon. It's, there, there's not enough room. So what you can do is you can inchworm your way down, do a couple of millimeters at a time with the osteoflash until you get it to its final location. And it'll, it'll flare out the whole stent in a really nice way that you can't do if you just go up front with the position that you're trying to finalize it to. I just learned that recently. I, I had no idea that that was a thing, but. <laughs> Stefan? Yeah, great case. Uh, um, I had a case uh, last week transferred f different. It was not an old stent. Here, I think the risk might have been different, but transferred with, you know, the typical situation where the, the operator was radial, the patient took a big breath in, and they landed the stent about three or four uh, <clears throat> struts into the RCA, and there's about 28 millimeter into the aorta. And then he lost his position, recannulated, and opened up the cell. And now it's just lo not looking great. And I was all about, I'm going to take this out, I'm going to snare it out and everything. And it's very good to, to discuss with your colleagues because they tempered my enthusiasm. They said, you know what, maybe by pulling, this, is, this was all, they, they ballooned it. The shock wave it, and then there was a risk of, you know, this aortic dissection. It's not like you may evolve everything, and so I, I elected for plan number two, like Bill discussed. I just collided it. I just left this in the aorta. Mm -hmm. Remember that in the structural world, people leave a lot of stuff in the aorta, and nothing happened. And so I left this overhanging stand crushed on the sinus and I kill out it, and I use that technique. But I think we don't know enough, so you 
of <clears throat> stentectomy is, it depends on how much the stent is well implanted, but there was like clearly a step down and it was embedded into the, the wall, so I didn't want to pull it out. But this case makes me think that maybe I could have done it, or but I was hesitating. Stefan, your point's a really smart. important one. So why do you think that that original stent failed? I mean, if yeah. it's sticking out, but why did it fail? I think I think it was, so you, So he had two stents in the prox, and so he had, I think he had this recurrent osteal lesion, and I believe what happens was either a breath, or maybe he got translated hypotensive or something, and they, at the time of deployment, in the cath report, it sounds like there was a moment where they kind no, of lost. No, I, I get that, but like, why do you think that that stent came back restenosed? Oh, because I mean, but, so what if yeah. it's hanging out a little bit, as as Stefan's alluding to? Does does that matter clinically if I the mean, stent's deployed correctly and expanded? I mean, me, I mean, mechanism. I would think most likely is under expansion at an osteo location. So that's another but, alternative yeah. solution to this but, problem, right? If this were to happen, is to image it and make sure it's actually expanded right. and just leave it. Yeah. Yeah, I, the, the, the take homes also in this is, as much, again, I think the, the stentectomy brings up lots of antibodies, but it's an irrational fear. Because almost all of them, right, 86% of stents in the U.S. are underdeployed because we don't do image-guided stenting. So it's really easy to pull. If they pull out, great, because they're underdeployed anyway, and you need to image and put a bigger stent in. So I just think... I understand where it's going, but we tend to have fears because people aren't good at snaring, because we have the history. But I know a lot of people have taken stents out. I've done it by accident. I've done it intentionally. <laughs> and you're, you might get a coronary dissection. That's why you got to be good at managing a coronary dissection. But I think it's almost always underdeployed. If you want to do it, great. If you want to do it a different technique, great. Nobody's ever going to know right or wrong. Um, with that great case, I, I'm really looking forward to seeing Rick Shunk's worst case of the year. This should be an emotionally enriching event for all of us, Rick. <laughs> Where the mic? The mic's on the table. Right here. Right. Yeah, thanks, Bill. Um, actually, that was the stock title, and I didn't get a chance to change it. But um, so I, this this is a this is a great session, by the way. I really enjoy this and the feedback that's coming here. Um, let me let me move into this case because this is a little bit different. Um, theme here in my um, disclosures. So this is a case, I think, that <clears throat> illustrates some of the things we've been talking about here already and some of the stuff that came up um, at, at your course recently, Bill, um, uh, regarding what type of cases are we actually doing? Sometimes it's not clear. So this was a patient who came in to the STEMI team on the weekend. He had a non-STEMI, but he was in shock. It was a Sunday. The on-call team came in. It was a pretty good team on. They came in. They put in a balloon pump to manage the hypotension and shock. They put in a PA catheter to figure out where they were. The patient was volume overloaded and so on. And they identified what they thought was a culprit, and they were unable to wire it. Um, so they transferred the patient to the unit. Um, you know, an 80-year-old veteran post-cabbage, and they're thinking about options. What do we do? Should we just try to manage medically, try to wean the balloon pump? And so... Um, as I said, prior history of cabbage, there was a lima to the LED, there was a skip graft that went from uh, aorta to the OM to a right PDA and then a separate vein graft to a diagonal. And I'll just go through that um, quickly. This is the diagnostic. The lima is fine to the LED. Here's the native system. There's a little bit coming off the left of the LED system. There's a, a couple of septals and diagonals. And there's no circumflex, right? The circumflex is missing. Um, here's their shots of the right coronary. It looks reasonably well engaged, not well opacified. And if you look in that REO view on the right there, there's even a hint of some competitive flow maybe in the PDA. So um, a little bit suboptimal uh, imaging in this situation where the patient's shocky, balloon pump, tachycardic. Um, here are the vein graphs. There's this vein you see on the left image that goes to a diagonal. And then here's the stump of the vein that used to go to an OM and to the PDA. So maybe I should just pause here for one second. You're the on-call STEMI guy, and this case is here. Any, any thoughts, anybody, what, what the culprit is or what are you going to do? Should I? So, of course, the EKG changes and all that stuff are going to tell you and LV gram and or echo can tell you where's the wall motion abnormality. It might be the circ, the SVG to the circ. 
and if you have all the techniques and uh, you in your armamentarium, it will be basically easier to uh, start it if you couldn't open it or wire it. Yeah. I gotta admit, I kind of think it's the right, and this is when everybody starts to talk about non stemmies you know, CTOs can cause non stemmies His skip graft is open. You can see the circ filling from the right. So a lot of times grafts will occlude, but the skips will stay open. So I would pause as to whether there's something more going on in the right than I realize. And the other is I would want to know that anyway because if I'm gonna open the circ, the easiest thing is to go down, get in the graft, go across the circ, and go retrograde. So that would be my thinking, but I think weird. Wow, have you seen this case? <laughs> um, so their feeling was it was circ, because the native circ is down, the graft that was known to go to Noam is down. So they're thinking, well, we got to get something to the lateral wall. We've seen at least some flow to the inferior wall on that suboptimal angiogram. So they, and, and this operator's, you know, not a not a bad operator actually has um, some skills with CTO has done some on a, on his own. Um, so you see on the left he's got the guide up he's got a microcatheter he's got a wire this is just a fluoro save, and you'll notice he gets fairly aggressive pushes the wire down follows it with the microcatheter, um, and there's a there's a push here where the thing just loops into the aorta the microcatheter loops out, prolapsing into the aorta, and they can't get through to anything, and they they stop. So, and decide, let's transfer him to the unit. Um, this is the final shot. There's no evident perforation. They get an echo just to make sure. What, Chuck, like, what do you guys think of the movement of the wire in a microcatheter? Was it in a vessel or outside a vessel? So, yeah, I went by that without commenting, but it looked to me like it was not constrained by vessel architecture, the wire. And then it did look like the microcatheter may have followed into that same... Uh, space. I'm not so sure. it's like open, like the circ, the circ has it's a small vessel with multiple back. branches, and a lot of those branches are small. So the Pilot 200 or any wire will take them. You have to have two guide catheters to open the circ. So otherwise, you'll you basically your wire normally goes in a small side of branch and involves it. And if you follow with the gear, and you'll die. So great. So. Um, the clinical challenge here was that the patient wasn't weaning off the balloon pump, was still sick. Um, there was circ and right coronary ischemia still, presumably, from the angiogram. And the vein graft to the OM skipping to the PDA is occluded, at least in the proximal portion. And obviously not a surgical candidate. I don't know if they would be in some of your hospitals, but a redo over 80. Uh, so can I just ask a quick question? Candidate. Was there even an attempt to try to put a wire down that graft, or they just went straight after the native? No, there was no attempt to go down the graft. So, I mean, like for example, just even with the workhorse and a multipurpose, and to see if you can go retrograde, or even maybe just cross it and give you some sort of flow in that territory without long-term intention of using the graft, is a, not an unreasonable way to go. Uh, it's an interest, I'd, I'd be interested in comments from the panel about that. In, in acute settings, people going after completely occluded vein grafts or going after the native? It depends on, on the skill sets available. So in acute setting, if you think you can open the native within the 90 minutes, if it is STEMI, I will open the native. If I think it's gonna be difficult, I will temporize it by opening the graft temporary and not leave the patient, we're gonna have to bring him back and follow it. What do you do, Bill? What do you do, guys, there? If, did you have prior images or angiograms of this patient to know um, prior to this event? Like, did you know what his native circ looked like um, before, or his RPDA, the graft to the two territories? Uh, no, I mean, this case came in as an acute. There wasn't any availability of old films. We were able to find a film subsequently. Um, I think this is all, go ahead, Ryan. Yeah. I think going after the native circ in something like this is a little bit uh, um, risky because you don't know the trajectory of the vessel. Um, so you, if you're having competitive flow down in the distal right, I think to me, logically, if the graft that was sequential is supplying that, I would try to get better blood flow there because I know where that vessel is. Um, and then maybe that would even lead to finding that jump part and get better blood flow to the circ territory. 
So can I just, before, we, we're gonna get lost, so Stefan, I'm gonna cut you off, which is, this is all about your narrative and your training. Some people might take a shot at the Van Graft. Some people might take a drop at the Native Cirque. Some people might take a shot at the right. Which one of those is right? Nobody in this room actually knows, so don't sound so confident. It's a non stemmy we have no idea. We don't have old films. That Van Graft may be occluded for years. The stump looks pretty concerning for that. I think the important part, and the piece I think Rick is trying to get to with this, and we should let him keep going, is there are lots of different things for all of us to learn from this. First of which is, stop arguing what's right. Let's work through the process of getting to what's gonna help the patient. Rick? Great, thanks. I, looks like my slides went down. I'll try to keep moving if, can you, here we go. Um, so, we brought him back to the lab um, when he was failing to wean, and we first thing we did is put dual guides in, and it was a little bit difficult to engage the right, so we've got, on this first shot, we've already got, <coughs> excuse me, a microcatheter and a wire down, and with good engagement, you see a whole different story here, and Bill uh, kind of spoiled the, the case here, I guess, but what you see now is there's high-grade disease in the right, down at the crux and in the PDA, but there's an orphan vein segment now that's going up to the circ. So the patient uh, is having inferior and lateral ischemia, and you see the CT, it's a CTO of the circ, and you can see that if you follow this, the orphan vein graft segment back to the native vessel, it's not a super long occlusion, but now we've had just a few days before somebody disrupting the, um, the tissue planes. So um, the bottom line is we, um, we, we wired this right corner, and we advanced to Corsair. I'm thinking, the patient's got a balloon pump. We're fine to do that. As soon as I put the Corsair through that right coronary lesion at the crux, the blood pressure went away. The patient developed uh, PEA arrest and required CPR. And that set us back for about an hour trying to resuscitate the patient and regroup. So for me, that was that was a big lesson that you don't have a whole lot of support with just a balloon pump and to really think carefully about this. But I won't stop here because we've had a lot of discussion already. But after we regroup, this is 45 minutes or later, we've now got an impella in place. We've got the patient stabilized. We've got um, circulation back. And uh, now we've got a guide catheter in the left system. And this is just zooming in to see where we're pointing toward the the native circ here. We tried to wire anagrade down the circ and kept getting in the subintimal plane that they'd been in previously, and then quickly switched to go uh, balloon first, obviously down in the in the crux of the right coronary, which enabled us to put the corsair down without consequence, um, and then utilized that skip vein graft to come back up to the circ and get right up to the distal cap, and then um, I won't belabor this, but weren't able to wire directly, but had to essentially a, essentially a star up retrograde to the left main and then snared the wire um, and pulled it out and, and uh, stented this thing up. At, and, and basically, at the end of the day, we stented both the right and the circ, and the patient stabilized and was able to be weaned off of everything and eventually was discharged. But for me, the, the real lessons were to understand the anatomy and exploit the anatomy. So there were two territories there that were ischemic. So essentially a left main equivalent. We didn't understand that going into the case. And secondly, a balloon pump is not an impella. <laughs> I learned that in this case. And, and I went into this case thinking, you know, I've been a little bit skeptical of this idea that every CTO case is a chip case or whatever. I'm not really understanding how you define each one, but um, Certainly there are cases where you have to think about support up front and serious support because you want to avoid CPR. <laughs> and, you know, an orphan skip graph can be a real friend in a case like this. Amazing case. We, we will have to move and hopefully we'll have some time. We'll save some time for discussion. And now, this is actually a great save, but the next talk, my best save of the uh, past year, uh, by Dr. Tsai, Thomas Tsai. And Rick, that was, the for the audience, that summation didn't need addition. It was perfect. Learn from that. I was just saying to Dr. Shank, like, that's your worst case, really? I mean
mean, um, so thanks for the invitation. Um, I'm going to talk about this case in the context of deposits and withdrawals. And so let's get started with the case here. No disclosures. This is a 69-year-old uh, female COPD, renal insufficiency, peripheral arterial disease, and claudication who told her family she wasn't feeling well. And shortly thereafter, she was found down in her bedroom. And EMS was called, and she was bradycardic, hypoxic, and, and hypotensive. And of course, this is a middle-of-the-night case. Um, her ECG showed inferior ST elevations with some lateral reciprocal changes, a little bit of AV uh, elevation in V1 as well, and probably a two to one AV block here. So the cardiac alert was called and, and they placed transcutaneous pacer pads on, said there was good capture and there really wasn't. Um, aspirin was administered, atropine, dopamine. She was intubated for persistent hypoxia, and they put a left femoral venous line in the ED, which is always scary. Um, and then her palpation of the femoral pulses showed significant bradycardia despite the good capture. And of course, up to the cath lab, she lost pulses. They administered CPR in the cath lab and in the elevator prior to that. Her dopamine was increased, NEO was, was added. Um, her left-sided uh, Venus axle is exchanged for an eight French sheath and we put in a pacer wire. Um, she had a barely palpable right common femoral pulse, so we um, accessed the left side with a six French sheath. And so the cath lab images couldn't find the right coronary. And so the left system looked fine, uh, LAD and circ, left vein, no significant disease, maybe some faint collaterals to the right. Um, and so we searched for the RCA osteum. So we tried all of these catheters and couldn't find it. Um, and so, you know, we did the uh, non-selective injections, LAO, RAO, and still really couldn't find the right coronary artery. So I'll sort of pause here and see what people would do next. So if the patient is stable enough, you can do a CAT scan at this stage, and that probably could show it. But if a patient is not stable and you have collaterals, uh, I'll take advantage of those and go retrograde. Other comments? So she was dying, and so we didn't have time to send her to the CT scanner. So we actually did a TEE, the patient, you know, uh, this is very uncommon to have a flush occlusion from my aortic dissection, but couldn't find the right coronary. And so we got a TEE, and you can see in the lab here, there's her left coronary, and right next to it is her right coronary. And so this basically diagnosed that she basically had an anomalous right. And now that you know what you're looking for, we looked at one of these previous non-selective injections, and you can see the staining if you look real closely of where that right coronary artery comes off the left sinus of Valsalva. And so now we have a diagnosis that this woman has a anomalous right coronary artery off the left sinus of Valsalva. You can see, um, is this the laser? You know, instead of coming off the right uh, coronary cusp here, it comes off the left, usually anterior and oblique. Um, but this is where I'm gonna pause here and sort of talk about, you know, quickly that this Anomaly is pretty rare as anomalous coronary arteries come. So I think in a career, you may or may not see this anomaly. I've seen it twice in my career now. Um, I bring up this slide because my kids and fellows, I used to say that you know what we do in the cath lab is very similar to airline pilots. We take off and we have our cath lab staff and we have our patient and we land when we land. Sometimes it's a very quick 60 minute diagnostic, take off and you land. Sometimes you have a complication and all of a sudden you're losing altitude and you gotta try and, and land the plane. And I just use this example as, you know, in 2009, Captain Sully, you remember this, he landed his disabled US Airways plane after he had multiple bird strikes to his engine at 2,800 feet and in 208 seconds, he landed that plane on the Hudson. And so they asked and they said, you know, how did you do this? And this is a comment I think Dr. Lombardi will like, not that you're 42 years into your experience, but he says, for 42 years I've been baking, uh, I've been making small regular deposits in this bank of experience, education and training. 
On July 15th, the balance was sufficient so that I could make a very large withdrawal. I use this analogy because I think all of our cases that we do are little deposits. Even your most simple diagnostic case, you can learn from that. And certainly any of these CTOs that we do in complex cases, you learn from. And what you're really hoping for is that that day when you need to make that big withdrawal, that you've banked enough experience, training, et cetera, to be able to tackle that case and maybe save the patient. And so I give kudos to courses like these because this is sort of how we learn and get better. So one of my deposits that I've made in the past is this case. So this is a 53-year-old patient who was working overseas for the military, anterior STEMI. Uh, they sent to the LAD and the bystander left circumflex. And he came back to the States with this report that he had an anomalous RCA CTO. Of course, there was no imaging for us, just a report. And he had severe exertional limiting vocational angina, and the films weren't available to review. So my colleague does a diagnostic angiogram on him. LAD looks fine, couldn't find the right coronary, different catheters, and finally, they engage this, in this case, an RCA CTO, uh, in the setting here of a patient who has exertional angina. And so failure preparation is preparation for failure. So of course, if we could prepare for each one of our cases, we would. And for this particular case, we looked in the literature and we found a lot of case reports and series about these anomalies. And there's different morphologies above and below, below the sinotubular plane. There's a little algorithm there in like 18 patients over 20 years experience about what type of guide catheters might fit that anomalous coronary. We did a CCTA on this patient in preparation for his RCA CTO procedure and found that he had a type B location of the RCA osteum. So that's below the sinotubular junction. And so there is an amazing article. I encourage you guys to take a picture, actually, you know, look at this, but it shows how you can manipulate a JL4 guide catheter to cannulate anomalous artery like this. And so I had the liberty and time to look this up and see how they did that. You take a JL4 and you literally just take the tip of it and you bend it 90 degrees towards you and it has this configuration. This is from the article that shows you, if you look at panel D, when we engage in the RAO view, you can see sort of how that would look. And that looks very much like this RCA CTO we had to tackle. So we brought the guy to the cath lab with this plan and this is the case, and that this is an eight French guide from below, and you can see how this manipulated eight French JL4 manipulated in that uh, paper the way they did it fit perfectly. And so here we are with this RCA CTO. We identified the cap with IVIS. We did anterograde crossing, microcatheter, subintimal, and luckily we got back in here and we were able to stent this artery. Patient's chest pain free, doing really well. But back to this flight, so. That patient, we landed fine. This patient's you know, at low altitude and crashing, but we remembered this case. And so we tried this with our patient, and actually that JL4 didn't fit very well, but we used an AL, which is also described. And this is, you know, used to be called the Leia catheter, which they don't make anymore because it's so infrequently used. But we, take a, we took an AL1 and basically made the same shape in this particular case now that we knew it was anomalous right coronary off the left sinus of Valsalva, and it fit. And it enabled us to wire this artery, stent this artery, and the patient was extubated in the ICU on hospital day three, discharged to a skilled nursing facility, and uh, discharged on day five in his home doing well. So this is sort of my large withdrawal from the deposits that uh, I had been making. So my three take-home points for this case, you know, is basically we're trying to land the plane every single time. And uh, you may see this anomalous right coronary off the left sinus of Valsalva once or twice in your career. I've seen it twice now, so hopefully I won't see another one. You gotta take root injections and multiple views, other imaging to find that artery. I mean, RCA STEMI's and RCA STEMI. And then our large withdrawal was just remembering this, uh, what we use for that CTO. So you can bend the distal tip of a JL3, 5, or 4, or an AL or an AL2 guide 90 degrees vertically to engage and intervene that particular anomaly and hopefully save the patient. And so that's, that's my case. Thank you. Thank you.
That's a wonderful case, Thomas. And since my dad was a flight instructor for United, he flew for 34 years, as you know. I'll bring up something. Sully's experience wasn't his experience. It was cumulative knowledge, mostly from education and training. Pilots are in simulators every six months to a year. Sully has flown that failure mode every year his whole career. That's where his experience came from, was doing a sim. Your ability to do that RCHTO was using cumulative experience. You found it in the literature. A lot of your experience you think you need to learn on your own, which is why we keep making the same mistakes. The point for everybody here is become more vulnerable to your failures, more vulnerable to your lack of education and training, and work on cumulative experience to make us all better. So it's not just the dumb luck that Tom had to happen to be on call that night, because if he's not, that person doesn't make it. The same thing with Rick. Dumb luck, that person's a lab. We need to do a lot better like the pilots, but it's not dumb luck. So cumulative experience. I really love your, your analogy, and I think it's important for all of us. Cath lab, do you recommend that? I mean, we're learning here, thank I've, you. But do you, do you drill in your labs for perforation, use of uh, those sorts of devices? So, so, yeah, so Bill does drills. And honestly, like, I, I think I don't do drills because I cause enough complications, so it's <laughs> over, over the drill. I'm, I'm <laughs> so, but but the, the moral of the story, we started with the airline. Do you remember when I said in the NTSB, it was a call for action that, uh, like, by the way, we all pay taxes. The best money we ever buy with our money is the FAA, because the, the FAA, the NTSB, are amazing at these drills that Bill just talked about. These drills take over and over, but more importantly, if a, an airplane goes down in Wyoming, within two months, all pilots in the country will know about it. We do not. Like, if I have a complication, Probably my colleagues who was that, that day in the hospital probably knew about it, and the rest of them will whisper about it, but nobody will openly discuss it, and we need to change that. And I think the call to action, are we going to be able to create something similar to the NTSB, where every one of us, if you have a complication, will investigate it and we put it in a database, you can actually Google it. You can Google the reports of Andrea Grinzik or any airplane uh, uh, crash, and you can learn from it. So the answer to your question is, some things we don't because we have it happen so often we don't need to anymore. But if you have low frequency events, like where's the pericardiocentesis tray? How long does that take to get in the room? When they bring it in the room, does it have all the right equipment in it? <laughs> right, like our perf kit for our lab, we have a box. It has pericardiocentesis tray, has the Chiba needles so we can do a dry tap, it has the extra stiff, extra long micropuncture needles so we can do a dry tap, it has all of our covered stents, and it has coils and coil pushers so that we have all the equipment we need to manage it every time. If you haven't put an Impella in, re-sterilize one, talk to Abiumed, have them come in and have your staff practice so that they can set it up faster than you can get access. But all of this should be trained in this. The, the other piece I'll give to this is mental training. Have you ever seen F1 drivers sitting there and they're driving the course in their head? I did a podcast on this with a guy named Dad Spoon whose kids are elite mountain bikers. They do a bunch of mental training before they ever hit a run. How often have you done mental training on what I'm gonna do when it goes south? So for Rick, I'm gonna cross that lesion. The patient crashes, what am I gonna do? And if he does that enough, he'll get to, that's a left main equivalent. This thing should scare the shit out of me. This guy is sick. This is a left main equivalent. Doesn't have normal heavy function. It's non-STEMI. Maybe I should put the impeller in now to buy me some time. Those are lessons we can all learn from and get better from. And I highly encourage you to do mental practice and do it on things that are not common because things that are common, you should have already learned from. And the last is, the flight instructors have different training than the pilots that are flying. That's why in the Navy, there's a Navy fighter pilot, then there's people who fly Top Gun, and then they're the Blue Angels. And they all train to incredibly different levels, 
And then you could sort of talk about test pilots. That's what you need to be focused on your career. I want to go from being a pilot to flying Top Gun to being a Blue Angel and continually iterate and get better. We are actually uh, 10 minutes over time. Uh, Manos, can you start that depository of uh, uh, complications so everybody, because Manos is the man of difficult uh, missions. Thank you so much. We're going to adjourn this meeting. It was a great, all the speakers did a great job. <laughs>